Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this new installment of our monthly professional education series in spiritual health, mission, and ethics. Our special guest speaker today is Linda Hochstetler, registered social worker and Buddhist lay chaplain. In her private practice in Toronto, she specializes in illness, dying, and death. And Linda is the author of a new book, uh, The Canadian Guide to End of Life, 21 Days to Die. At the end of our talk today, I'll give some details on how you can receive a free copy of Linda's book. So stay tuned for that. And um, uh, now I'll hand it over to Linda. Linda, uh, welcome. Herzlich willkommen to our professional education series. Vielen Dank. Thanks a lot for uh, inviting me and giving me a chance to talk about a topic that I can talk at length about. I have, uh, I have no end of uh, desire to talk about dying and death because I really feel like it's a topic that um, is just not brought into the common conversations, mainstream conversations anywhere, whether it's families, whether it's professionals. And so I've made it my life passion to talk about the dying process. And, you know, as I started doing a little bit of research, I realized that there's a lot of books about advanced care plans. There's a lot of books about grief, but it seems like the dying process is like a hot potato we all stay away from. Whether we're professionals, whether we are um, family members, it's, um, we struggle to want to be close to the dying process. And so uh, as a social worker uh, in private practice, I decided to really lean into this um, aspect of the dying process, but you know, realizing that we're all dying from the moment we're born, this is certainly the Buddhist idea, and I think you know it's a it's a universal that from the moment we're born we start heading towards the dying process, and uh, so uh, it's not it's not something to wait to the end to learn about, and so I bring I bring in an expertise of looking at the dying process from the point of an of an illness and then to a prognosis and then um, heading towards uh, life limiting, which is a new phrase for. Um, what used to be called terminal, and then um, the, the final 21 days of really recognizing what's happening as it's happening as we get closer to uh, the end of life. And so this is my specialty, the dying process. I do grief work as well, but I've, um, I find there is lots to learn and teach about the actual dying process. And uh, that's what I thought I'd bring you tonight today. So in addition to doing the social work, uh, psychosocial aspect with re this regard. I have a spiritual um, personal practice and one that I also like to bring to this work because I find end of life is such a spiritual time. So that's a little bit about me and I'm gonna launch into a bit of a presentation about the dying process and what those final 21 days are like. And then uh, there will be time to ask questions at the end. However, if there are things I explain along the way that you'd like to pause and ask more questions of, I encourage you to um, put something in the chat. If you have a question in the chat, I'll be monitoring the chat as we go along. And you're also welcome to put your hand up. Um, I notice most of you are off screen at the moment and that's okay. And if you would like to ask a question, uh, use the Zoom hand up um, and I'll, I'll call on you and welcome you to unmute and uh, ask your question um, if you'd like. And I'm happy to have you engage with me as well in this process. So now I'm going to just launch into the slides for a bit. And I wanted to tell you all that uh, a copy of these slides in PDF form will be placed on my website. And I'll tell you about that um, at the end of the presentation. And um, so if you want to simply listen and not take notes, everything that's in the presentation, you can actually see um, afterwards um, on my website. So if you wanna just sit and listen, uh, you're welcome to do so. So as I mentioned, and as Robert said there, um, I wrote a book about the dying process and uh, it's called 21 Days to Die, uh, The Canadian Guide to End of Life. You can purchase it through the uh, Sumeru publications uh, and also in person in, uh, in Toronto. 
So I want to start by explaining what hospice palliative care is, because I think it's really important to understand how hospice palliative care informs the, 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 the final 21 days and the dying process. Unfortunately, hospice palliative care is not a part of every single dying person in Canada's experience, and that's for a variety of reasons, but certainly uh, it helps the dying process. And if more people can learn about the dying process, they will be more motivated to activate the hospice palliative care because it makes such a big difference and is probably the greatest determinant of whether someone has a good death or not. So the World Health Organization describes palliative care as an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness. We used to call that terminal. Through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. So I highlight in here that it's about uh, prevention and relief of suffering. So anticipating what might happen. So there has to be some knowledge about what kind of suffering might come up. It has to be offered not only to patients, but to their families as well. And I love this word impeccable. It is impeccable assessment and treatment that is owed to the dying so that it is not just sort of shunted off to the side, but it is actually impeccable assessment and treatment that, that uh, we are aspiring to offer to dying people and their family members. And again, one of the reasons that I, as a spiritual social worker, really enjoy the work of dying is because finally, spirituality is allowed a place. While spirituality is often on the side in illness journeys and other uh, tough times, when it comes to the dying process, spirituality is welcomed. Dying process. When I look at, when I show you this list, I've mixed up the list. It's not in the correct order. But I wonder whether you can look at this list and I wonder whether you can know what is the sequence of the dying process. It's my wish that every single person looks at this list of five uh, different uh, losses and can immediately say, oh, the dying process is like this. Because in most situations, like truly most dying situations, regardless of the illness, there is a particular process that happens, a particular sequence. So I mixed up this sequence um, just to be able to show you and give you a chance to look at. And I don't know if any of you want to go off, off your mute just for a moment to shout out to me, what's the first thing that happens in the dying process? Can anyone tell me? Number five, not quite, that'll be next. But the very first thing that happens is extreme fatigue. Number four, sorry, number three. Yeah, Vivian, you wrote, you named that. So extreme fatigue is, is separated from the kind of everyday fatigue that we might feel if we are tired at the end of a workday. That's fatigue. But there is a point when we can no longer work. There is a point in the dying process when one cannot uh, uh, work, can't volunteer, can't take care of themselves, can't contribute anything, can't really do much of anything. And it is an extreme fatigue. What comes after the fatigue? I kind of mentioned Tim said number five. And the next thing that happens after fatigue is the body starts to pull water from the muscles such that the body can, that the legs can no longer support the body. We often, if you visually know what this looks like, it looks like a large, often swollen torso, a large belly, and the arms and legs are very skinny and have lost all their muscle. And there is, they are, the body is slowly losing its water looks a little bit like a spider. Um, and what happens is the body, the legs no longer have sufficient muscle to support this body. And uh, at risk of falling, the legs do not support 
the this body and um, people can no longer walk to the washroom and this point of not walking to the washroom and losing independence of uh, the the bowel uh, function the toileting part is a major step in the dying process that many people obsess over and yet it is uh, a step with a few more to go afterwards but not many and not long so once there is fatigue, can no longer walk. What's the next step in the dying process? That's right, Tim, the second one, stopping, swallowing and eating. And I talk about it as swallowing and eating because the reason there's, there, there are two different things. And sometimes one leads more than the other, but swallowing is when the muscles of the throat do not work and simply cannot feed the food down into the mouth, into the, into the stomach. And we don't think of our swallowing muscles as anything that's to be valued, and yet they work so well, we don't even think about them. But at end of life, there comes a time when the swallowing muscle does not work and the, uh, the individual cannot, cannot eat um, because they are at risk of uh, pneumonia because the food might go into the lungs rather than the stomach. And the other reason why they might stop eating is because the pain of elimination becomes too much and the body does not um, want to keep eating because it's, uh, it's, there, there, there's no way to eliminate um, that which is left. After this, what's next? What's the next stage? Any guesses? That's right, Vivian. Yeah, and Vijita, uh, the water part. So after, so first is food. First we stop eating. And after that, we stop drinking. We stop drinking water. And it's very hard to watch someone do this stopping eating and drinking, but it is a absolutely necessary part of the dying process to no longer drink water. And there will be a time when the individual's mouth is very dry and they want sips of water or possibly ice chips, but the water, the body has removed itself of most of the water um, and the water that is going into the dying person at this in the final uh, stage, just before the end of, of life is actually just water to wet the mouth. And it's more about mouth care and water water in the mouth rather than drinking. There's no more drinking of water right at the very end. And then as you can tell, the very last thing that happens in the dying process is stopping breathing. And the breath has been with us all our lives since birth. And at a particular moment, the breathing stops. And this is what we, we call death. So these five stages of the dying process are also found in this palliative performance scale. And I, I put this up, it looks a little complicated, but I want you to know that it's actually not as complicated as it looks. And it's super important to understand these numbers. If you're ever with a dying person and wanting to know where are they in the dying process? And one, um, doctors and nurses are the only ones that can assign numbers. But once you understand how these numbers work, anyone can recognize numbers and know, oh, if they have this number, well, then I know that it means this. And you can see on the left, the left-hand column is the level. And it's essentially a 100 all the way down to zero. It's called a decremental scale by tens. And the first 50% from 100 down to 50 people may go up and down. And it's possible to start at 100, drop to 90, 80, and then go back up to 90 or 100. Um, but once someone hits 50, one rarely goes back up again. So this is a scale that um, is used early on at, um, to measure kind of where the, the individual is in terms of how much activity they can handle, how much walking they're doing, how much self-care of themselves they're doing. 
But it's also really important to understand uh, where one might want to be, the setting, because at the point that someone can no longer walk to the washroom, they've already gone through the extreme fatigue phase. And when they can no longer walk to the washroom, they are now a 30%. And 40% is when they are mainly in bed and only getting up to use the washroom and to return again. And at, people will often choose to be at home during this time and can, as long as they're able to walk to the washroom, they may be able to manage the dying process. But when one gets to the place where they can no longer take care of their own toileting needs, they need 24 seven care. And that is often the time to consider where someone might transfer to, um, to what place they might get 24 seven care. And then you can see on here that 40% is when they're in bed, but they're, uh, and they have fatigue, but they're still walking. And at 30, they have now dropped down to um, uh, no longer walking anymore. When they can no longer eat, their PPS drops to 20. When they can no longer drink, they are at 10. And finally, when they can no longer breathe, they drop to zero. So I mentioned that the location where one is makes such a big difference as to whether someone um, uh, is experiencing uh, good care or not. And I'll just go briefly into three different locations where people usually die. And the first one is the residential hospice, which is a 24 seven place just for uh, dying. Um, the number of beds in Toronto keeps going up and down, but it's relatively low and throughout the province, um, we're still scrambling to get enough beds to meet the need. The residential hospice, if you've never seen one, is worth a trip. Um, they don't do in-person visits anymore, um, but when the pandemic uh, uh, goes down and we can actually do visits, I highly recommend a visit to a residential hospice if you've never been in one. Um, one needs usually a three month prognosis or less. And so um, it's a relatively short time that one stays in a residential hospice, but the time period when one can no longer walk is a very good time to um, be in a residential hospice. And in fact, my title of the book, 21 Days to Die, comes from the fact that at the resident, residential hospice I worked at for several years, 21 days was the average number that people came to the hospice uh, before they died. So some came much shorter, one or two days, some came for three months, but it was the average number of days um, at the end of life. One can also choose to die at home where you have home care from what used to be called the Lynn and um, also visiting hospice where there are volunteers that will come into your home to um, offer a wide range of services. And um, they can really, uh, if you have family support, uh, loved ones, people able to take care of you at home, many people will, will want to stay at home um, and die at home. There's a greater number of people wanting that. And yeah. it's a great way to know that there are, there are services that can be brought home in the form of the uh, provincial health care, home health care, and also vol volunteers through hospice. Depending on your type of cancer or your type of illness at end of life, you may want to be in a palliative care unit. These are in hospitals and also in long-term care homes. And you know you're in a palliative care unit if you have your own room and uh, it's, you know, they, they, can, they can handle all kinds of treatments and it's possible to, to be getting chemo and other kinds of transfusions and IV drips and things like that all the way to the end of life. And if you want to continue with those kinds of treatments to the end, then a palliative care unit is a good place to get that. One of the most important things I tell people when they uh, report an illness that um, has been diagnosed is to understand what the most likely trajectory of that illness will be. And it's in, it's not, it's not written in stone. It's not, you know, guaranteed, but based on the illness, doctors will generally know what kind of dying process will happen. So if someone has 
heart issues, they will likely experience the top one, sudden death. Sudden death is where you have a high functioning of life and all of a sudden one day you have a heart attack, maybe that moment, maybe that week, uh, you die and you drop suddenly from that high function to death. Terminal illness is the most common trajectory for cancer, although it includes a lot of other illnesses as well. But essentially you can have a high standard of living, good quality of life, and then have a diagnosis and slowly, not so slowly, one drops from high functioning down to death. And it may be uh, weeks, it may be years, could be even decades, but the idea is you drop from high down to death without ever going back up again, always continually losing, uh, losing uh, abilities. The organ failure trajectory is uh, common for some of the, the organs like kidneys, uh, lungs, uh, heart, where there is a medium high function and then there will be crises sometimes many crises. And after each crisis, uh, you bounce back up a little bit, never as high as you were before, and wait for the next crisis. COPD is a very common one for organ failure, and it is extremely difficult on loved ones as well as the dying person because you never know how low these uh, lows are. You don't ever know whether you're Dropped, dropping low enough to, to die or whether you will live to see another day. So prognoses for organ failure are really, really hard to be accurate. Frailty is uh, one that often will land you in a long-term care home. Could be something like a stroke or uh, Alzheimer's or any of the dementia. And it happens more likely with old age where someone has a generally low function in life and it just continues to drop slowly, gradually, never going up again, but it makes it very hard to predict when death will come because one can function for such a long time at a very low level. It's hard to know what will be the tragedy. And for many with frailty, it ends up being something simple like pneumonia uh, that uh, is the final cause of death because whatever the chronic illnesses are that make one frail, it's hard to know whether that will be the actual cause of death one day. So palliative care is something that has been around for, um, since 1974 in Canada, and yet it is constantly changing. And the old model of palliative care was do life prolonging care treatment as long as possible. And at the point that it seems to not work, switch over, give someone hospice and they use hospice till the end of life. And we realized that there's no reason for it to be as mutually exclusive. And the new models now will combine uh, life prolonging care with palliative care. And so that means that at the same time that one has a diagnosis, of some life limiting illness, they might get chemo, they might get radiation, they might get dialysis, they might get all kinds of, they might get um, transfusions, IV drips. There's a lot of different kinds of um, treatment that they might be offered and be offered symptom relief, which is the hallmark of palliative care. And they can continue both of these in differing amounts. And then at a certain point, there will be a time where the treatment aspect ends and the person accepts that they are dying and there's, a, there's an, a, a, an, a time between the last treatment and the end of life. And we're trying to do a bit larger time in here. And we know that if there is good symptom relief given uh, during the treatment that often people live longer. And so there was always a fear that if someone, uh, started palliative care too early that they would die sooner. They would give up hope, I think was the, um, the myth. And they realize now that um, getting good symptom relief actually allows the individual to, um, to live longer, have a better quality of life. And that becomes the hospice 
aspect where someone may actually live in a residential hospice and they may have been given a particular uh, uh, prognosis and entered and qualified to go into hospice and yet they may uh, live longer than anticipated because uh, with good symptom relief, uh, people sometimes live longer and with better quality of life, which is truly at the end of the day, what people are hoping for. And you can see that bereavement supports has been added to this model, recognizing that after death, there are many supports needed for the individual's family, even after that person is gone. Can I just pause for a moment and just check in any questions? You're welcome, again, for anyone who's joined, you're welcome to put questions in the chat. Um, you're also welcome to um, raise your hand using the Zoom model, and um, I'm happy to take questions along the way as well. All right, I'll continue on. One of the um, really important aspects of the dying process that is important to understand is something called standard orders. And the idea of standard orders is that there are many common uh, symptoms that will appear in the body as one nears the dying process. So as you get closer to the end, it is common for the body to have any of these uh, symptoms and they are so common, in fact, that at the point that your doctor says you are nearing the end and it is time to go off all your life sustaining medications, we're going to give, we're going to trade those for a list of standard orders. So truly individuals should know when they are on palliative care because at that point, it is palliative care essentially begins at the point when the life-sustaining medications like cholesterol pills, blood pressure, um, even uh, insulin, some of, some of the, the uh, medications that people have been taking for many, many years, they will be invited to go off of them. There's some that they might stay on just because um, like uh, many people stay on seizure medication because it's really quite uh, upsetting to have a seizure, even though it's not a life sustaining, it's not a life questioning thing. So there's some, there are some life sustaining um, uh, medications people will stay on even with palliative care, but a lot of them con concerning the heart, individual will be invited to, to, to stop. And there can be some relief in stopping all of those uh, medications. And instead, there is this idea of standard orders, which um, essentially it's like one big prescription, one big prescription pad that allows a doctor to say, these are symptoms that might, might come up at the end. And how about if we just write um, uh, a prescription for any of these and any nurse um, can actually um, administer these at any time of the night. Any family member can take this prescription to a 24-7 um, uh, uh, drug mart and pick up these medications and administer them so that no matter what the symptoms are that might appear any time of day or night, they can immediately be treated. The only, the only ex uh, exception to that is... Uh, opioids and narcotics. So pain medicine must always go through the doctor, whether it's going up or down, but any of the other um, symptoms can be treated immediate, immediately and easily. Eating food is such a basic to human life that as we get into the dying process, it's really difficult to imagine um, stopping eating. And many family members have this idea that uh, if I can just get my loved one to eat, they'll stay alive. And so there is a regular stopping of eating that happens when for some people it's hours before they die, but for many people, it's a couple of weeks before they die, often during that roughly 21 days. And the individual um, cannot handle the food, it's pocketed in their, in their mouth. And so they stop eating. 
um, either because they don't want to, or maybe a nurse tells them it's time to stop eating. And voluntary stopping and eating and drinking is something that it, um, uh, we're beginning to understand that it's a very important part of natural death where quality of life is, is slipped low enough for the dying person to say, I'm going to choose to stop eating and drinking. And it allows, so, so when the, the dying person says, I'm ready for death and I'm going to stop eating and drinking, uh, it helps if they do it completely because if there's absolutely nothing going into their mouths, um, it, it signals to the organs to shut down and death comes uh, more quickly and more easily. And just like during fasts that many religions use, uh, not eating at all and not drinking allows the body to go into a sort of euphoria and a spiritual state. And so there uh, many spiritual groups are, are looking to voluntary stopping eating and drinking as a way of allowing the individual to accept death, um, move into uh, spiritual practices instead, and um, be ready for the dying process and um, allow it to happen uh, naturally with more ease. And it's, it ends up being not like stopping eating and drinking for people like us on this call perhaps, but it's a very different thing when the body is very close to death already. We're not talking about doing it, you know, when there's still like a year to live, but I'm talking about doing it at the point when uh, the body has lost all of its reserves. There is nothing left in the muscles. There's no water left in the muscles um, and is probably sometime after uh, stopping walking, but it allows the body to simply um, move into the spiritual end instead. Kathy Cortez Miller is a social worker who says, death is not a medical event, it's a social process. Yes, it's difficult, yes, it's sad, but that's part of the cost we pay for loving someone, for having the privilege of getting to know them and caring for them and growing old with them, whatever that might look like. So I just put this slide in to remind us all that um, whether we work in the medical system, whether we work in a non-medical uh, setting, we want to make sure that we remember the social process of end of life. Dr. Ira Bayok is one of my favorite palliative care doctors, and he's one of the oldies in the U.S., been around since the 80s and 90s. And he wrote a book called Four Things That Matter Most. And these are conversations people can have with loved ones um, as one gets closer to the end of life. And if you're not sure how to talk to a dying person and their families, I highly recommend, recommend these four conversations. And they're just ways for family members to reiterate uh, messages that have been said before um, they could also be uh, messages, words that have never been spoken, but at the same, but were sort of felt. And it's an death is an opportunity for loved ones to actually resolve some issues and put into words some of the forgiveness, appreciation, and love that they feel, but um, might not, under normal circumstances, be comfortable sharing. Death is a time of loss. There are so many losses. There are so many, there are so many um, things that we have given up by the time that the last breath is taken. And so it's important when you're talking with people who are dying to realize that every loss is a big loss. Stopping working is huge for many people. How about stopping driving, traveling, being with people? There's a real withdrawal from this lifetime as one nears the end. Um, Felix, you're asking about the social process. And so the social process is, is this idea that um, we are, we are connect, the dying person is connected to their loved ones and the loved ones are helping them end this lifetime. And there are these losses that are coming up for them. And yet there are still things they can do. They can be with each other. There's a lot less being, there's a lot less doing and a lot more being. And the social part is there are many 
conversations that bring such beautiful resolution at end of life between family members. It's really important to recognize that not all family members will do this. And I've had some individuals that I've invited to do some of the um, four things that matter most conversations and they've not wanted to, but they've contemplated it and then decided not to. And so part of it is recognizing that every, in every dying person will do it their own way. Some will take the opportunity to resolve some of the social issues between themselves and their family members and others will not. And as uh, spiritual care supports, there is no right way to do it with others. And rather it's more about um, inviting conversations and inviting individuals to, um, to connect with each other and to see what they want to do. There's a lot of weird stuff that comes up at end of life. And I don't know about you guys, but um, when you're talking with people from all different faiths, it can be quite interesting to, to notice what happens and to try to put it into the language and words and belief system of individuals uh, around you. So Sarah Kerr is a death doula out in Calgary, BC. And she is a shaman herself. And I like how she has some generic language for um, speaking about the universality, the universality of some of the things that happen around death that we have a hard time explaining um, from a material uh, perspective. So she talks about how many people will experience premonitions. And as, we're, as we look at this death side here, there's a lot of different aspects that happen at the end of life um, that uh, show people whether they believe in things or not, like whether they, whether they think they have a spirituality or not, there's a lot of things that come up at end of life that sort of crack open that door or reinforce it if they already have, a, have the idea of spirituality. So she has this, this circle that I find quite helpful to imagine um, and to use some of the language so that regardless of who you're speaking with about death, you can help um, put it in a context that makes sense to them. So I've had a lot of experience watching hundreds and hundreds of people die in all kinds of settings from hospice to home, home care to um, palliative care units. And there are some interesting paranormal type things, otherworldly kind of things that happen. It's extremely common for dying people to visit loved ones and it's always comforting when this happens and the dying people return, sorry, the loved ones return to tell them that it's time and it's time to come home is often the language that's heard. I've also noticed how sometimes dying people can hear conversations that um, even if they're not there. And so we always talk about remembering that if you're speaking about someone that you're um, making sure that they uh, that you're doing it in a respectful way, even if they're not in the same room, because the dying process kind of opens up portals of time and space. Sometimes people will know who's dying, even if they haven't been told something. There's a lot of signs that appear coins, feathers, items that move, um, birds, a lot of different ways that people will tell you that they have seen their loved one, they have felt their loved one and the loved one has uh, returned. I have a story to tell you about sort of um, energy that appears at end of life and how there seems to be some electrical mysteries that happen. I was with a gentleman who, came into the hospice on his first day and we were talking, I was asking about his spirituality and he was lying on this um, hospital bed and it had his family members around him. There are about five of us in the room and I was asking him about his spirituality and dying and what he believed. And he said to me, I don't think anything happens at the end. I think the lights just go out. You die, you take your last breath and you're gone, you leave the earth. He said, ah, okay, that's fine. And as we're standing there, and he was a little defensive, but he was very adamant that he really got annoyed with anybody who kind of talked about any, uh, anything more. So he told me this and he said, yeah, nothing happens. 
And in the next moment, his hospital bed that he was lying on suddenly sat up. So he sat up in the hospital bed. And if you know anything about hospital beds, they have these round, um, oh, they're about this big kind of buttons. And his button, the on off button for the motor was lying in full view between all five of us. We were all looking at it. We we're all standing around him and we were all looking at this button and no one was touching this button. And as he says this, you know, he says, nothing happens, the lights go out. And the motor, the, the, the bed just slowly sat up. He kind of looked around, started giggling and kind of said, yeah, or maybe I'm wrong. And the bed lay back down. I don't know what it means. This man didn't believe in any kind of afterlife, but there was, you know, these are some of the mysteries that seem to happen at end of life. And we don't always know what it means. You know, does it mean this thing? Does it mean that thing? I'm not sure. But these kind of paranormal experiences are fairly common at end of life and they appear um, regardless whether people have faith or regardless whether they don't. All right, I'm gonna just stop sharing and check in. Would anyone like to make a comment, perhaps ask a question, little more explanation about anything? Anything new? Did you, did you learn anything today? Did you know all this before? Those, uh, those uh, paranormal experiences at near the end of life are always very interesting. I've experienced a number of them myself with patients and uh, it just makes you wonder, you know, they're beautiful. Yeah. Patients reaching out to, looks like they're having a conversation with someone standing at the end of the bed or just the feeling that there's uh, an energy there. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. I like to leave it in the land of mystery because I yeah. don't know what it means exactly. I don't know what it means for them. I don't know what it means for me, but I want to just share it and just say there are a lot of mysteries at the end. Absolutely. Yeah. I wonder if you could comment a little more about your own connection to uh, spirituality, Buddhism, uh, how that um, plays into the work that you do, and perhaps also give some suggestions to how we might support uh, Buddhist patients. What do they need uh, at the end of life and how does that contribute to the quality of life and the care that we can provide? Yeah, great question. So, so Buddhism um, seems to uh, encourage death practices more than anything else, any other religion I've ever heard of. Now, I, you can tell me if that's uh, if your religion has other practices, but there's an idea in Buddhism that essentially um, it's a good thing to practice um, thinking about your own death. And there's an app, if anybody's interested, called We Croak. And the app will send you a message five times a day to remind you that you're going to die one day. It's kind of a funny thing, but it tells you it's very symbolic of Buddhism. Buddhism says you need to remember that life is impermanent and this lifetime is but one lifetime. There will be more. And if you can appreciate this lifetime and recognize the impermanence of this lifetime, you'll, you will live more joyfully. So there's a lot of Buddhist practices where you vision your own body dying in the final minutes. You also envision being told your loved ones are dying. There are visions uh, that you practice um, watching your body decay in what they used to call the charnel grounds, which is like if you're in Asia, the charnel grounds would be like the open um, places where bodies would be laid and the animals would come and worms would come and bodies would just go through the natural process and a Buddhist would go and study this, watch this, and you were encouraged to imagine watching your own body dying. It sounds kind of gross, it sounds kind of morbid, but when one practices um, impermanence and practices that 
you can then appreciate, it helps you appreciate the moment where you are still here, your loved ones are still here, maybe, and you're able to um, uh, live in gratitude and appreciation that this is good. And so uh, most Buddhists will want to have uh, a very calm setting. And I think this applies to other religions as well. But I can simply say that, that to the Buddhist, the final moments matter. So the way that the final moments happen will affect the rebirthing process. So it's very important that, you know, how, how uh, the room is, that people stay calm, that people are allowed to do spiritual practices at the end. It's fairly common for individuals to say goodbye to loved ones and to have family and loved ones in the background. I had one Buddhist who wanted to sit and look out the window of the hospice. And so his bed was set up so he would look out the window and his family sat on the couch behind him. So it's as if he was allowed to do his spiritual work with his family watching, but the family had actually said goodbye to him already um, with the idea that uh, the storytelling that one often does at end of life that is so rich and so meaningful uh, is paced a little bit earlier in the process. And one, uh, for a Buddhist, they might want to say all their stories, all the I love yous and thank yous, and say goodbye to family members and whoever, want, whoever will keep them here on this earth. And then uh, by saying goodbye to them, it allows the natural death process to happen more easily, more seamlessly, and for the individual to then use the final days of, the, of, of living to practice a spiritual practice. There's also a bit of a, of a, of a question around opioid use for Buddhists because uh, Buddhists really believe in having a clear mind at end of life that allows them to go into the bardos and go into the rebirthing process with the clearest mind possible in order to choose the best rebirth for the next lifetime. So that doesn't, there's been a lot of talk about this because um, I think early on, uh, many Buddhists thought that meant no opioid, opioid use at all, like no pain medicine. And the dying process is painful. And it's really the question of how do you have the clearest mind? And I think many uh, Buddhists today, probably not all, um, would say that the clearest mind is the goal. And that might be through some opioid use, but they may want to um, have less opioid use than the average uh, person, hoping that they can have a clear mind um, towards the end, but probably not having zero pain medicine because that also is, no, is not a clear mind. Have any of you had Buddhists in your practice at end of life? Did it... Any, any, anything come up that they, any requests that they made that you didn't understand? I had a, a family a number of years ago and what you're saying um, sort of resonates. They were asking for kind of a peaceful environment and um, yeah, so that, uh, that's consistent. I just wanted to thank you, Linda, uh, for the exercise at the beginning and the, the palliative scores that you walked us through. Um, that was uh, that was really helpful for me. Something that I didn't like. I see them all the time. I see the scores all the time, but I've never seen that chart, and uh, it was really clear. So thanks. That's great. It's I, I really want everyone to know it. So when you have a friend or a colleague who's in in a hospital in in you know and dying, you want to know what is their PPS scale today. And I want us all to get used to asking that question. It's not, it, it, it's shared. They will tell you, what is the PPS scale today? And, and if you know it, you know, you have a little better expectation of what to expect when you walk into the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of shorthand. Linda, there's a question from Felix in the chat to, to yeah. asking you to expand more on the social aspects. And maybe he has something to add to that question too. I'm not sure. Go ahead, Felix. Oops, you're muted. 
Yes. Can you hear me, please? Yes. Yes. Please, could you shed light on uh, why some seem to uh, transition calmly and uh, seamlessly, and why others seem to uh, show some somatic vibration or discomfort uh, during dying, the dying process? It's a very tough question, and you know, I think I think it's important not to judge someone who has a really hard death. Um, because it's very easy to say, well, you know, if you were a good spiritual person, you, you would have worked out your karma, done good spiritual practice, and there'd be no, um, there'd be no discomfort at the end. But life isn't like that. It's kind of that same question as, you know, why, why does it seem some people have very uh, tragic lives? And I would, I would say it really is that same question that why do, do some people have tragic deaths? It's a mystery. There, there are things one can do at the end to mitigate some of the pain and suffering, like having good healthcare supports, like having uh, supportive family members, like doing a spiritual practice. But unfortunately, there is no guarantee that life can be painful and death can be painful too. So, you know, I think it's sort of, it's like many things that if we can do what we can to make uh, death uh, more easeful in terms of both medical as well as non-medical treatments, then I think it's better for the dying person. But we cannot expect perfection in death any more than we can expect perfection in life. Thank you. Great question. Fritz, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. I just have a question um, pertaining to uh, uh, the whole element of suffering and looking at euthanasia as a relievement of that suffering. If you have any elaborations on that. I mean, in many ways, Fritz, from a Buddhist perspective, um, medical assistance in dying, the maid, is an, a, an extreme form of opioid use. It's a deliberate form of opioid use to, to completely end a life. So most Buddhists, and I always want to be careful to say, I'm not, I don't want to generalize, but I do want to say most Buddhists will say that to use um, as much medication as, as is needed to actually end a life through medical assistance in dying is generally going to cloud the mind and not allow mm -hmm. the individual to also uh, choose a good rebirth. So for that reason, most Buddhists will not choose to do medical assistance in dying. That the clouding of the mind is, it's like, it's, it's, it's impossible to actually have medical assistance in dying without clouding the mind. Many people who only believe in one life uh, will not have that be such a concern. But if, if you believe in multiple lives, um, it's, it's, uh, it's considered to be uh, less than ideal. And someone who has a very uh, painful situation might do the voluntary stopping eating and drinking which is something mm -hmm. that a Buddhist would uh, take on because it is, it's, not a, it's not about clouding the mind. And one also mm -hmm. often releases the mind through voluntary stopping eating and drinking in a, way, in a different way. Does mm -hmm. that answer the question? Uh, yes, it does. That's a good direction. Thank you very much. I'm curious whether whether that whether that lines up with other faiths in your practice. I'm not sure what your spirituality is or, or how that fits in. Do you care to say any more about how it fits in from your perspective? Um, that's a good question. I was more or less um, asking the question just based on some experiential learning where it does come up frequently in dialogue. Yeah. I'm looking for a way to end this pain. And, yeah. and this is, and family, I just recently, about a day ago, I had a family member who was proposing it to their spouse. And this was part of the challenge. The spouse was not open to it, but she was accepting it. 
mm-hmm. because there was a lot of experience on her family members suggesting this, his own background with pain and his parents. So, mm-hmm. so there's that ex- experiential part where it's irregardless of the faith tradition. Mm-hmm. It seems like when it comes to man- pain management, that this enters a discussion often. Yeah. I mean, one of the one of the interesting things about medical assistance in dying is you don't miss out on having to say goodbye. You don't miss mm-hmm. out on the dying process. You still have to go through it. So in the naming of the desire to have medical assistance in dying and then waiting for the assessment and then waiting for the second assessment and then the process, you go through the dying process. So many people have this idea of, oh, I wanna just have it done to me, kind of. I wanna passively have death done quickly. And even medical assistance in dying requires a facing of death. And Mm -hmm. so you can't get out of it. (laughs) And many people don't know when the right time to ask for it is. I've watched numerous people wait and wait and wait. And then finally, they say, I'm ready to ask for medical assistance in dying. Please ask the doctor to do a visit tomorrow. I make the request and the next morning, they're unresponsive, no longer qualifying, and they've said goodbye. And it's fascinating to watch at the spiritual level that there is some sort of letting go that happens in medical assistance in dying because one must always face one's death. That you mm-hmm. cannot get out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks for bringing that in. It's a, I know it's an important part of of uh, many spiritual care workers, and you know, as always, there is a personal belief that we're all. Yeah. I think it's really important that we all do the work of looking inward and saying, "What do I think?" You know. How do I, what's my opinion for myself? Because I get to decide for me. And then there's the professional and how do you work with options? How do you help with individuals who have different options? They might make different um, decisions. And how do you, how do you uh, engage with those decisions? Yeah. So I just have an additional question. I I know you did ask me my, um, I come from a Christian background. But I also have reflected with staff members who, who the dying process affects them. And, and can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I mean, it's my wish that every person does the work of facing their own dying because mm. dying is a part of living. And so, whether, you know, especially if it's your job to be with others who are uh, in the dying process, it's really important that you do the work to know what it's like and that you have thought about living and dying so that as, you, um, as you're working with other people, you can't help them if you haven't done the work yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I have, have I'm a, sorry, I came late and I'm leaving now, but I really, uh, I do work in palliative care for like 20 years. So some of it was not new, but it was really excellent to have a discussion. Thank you so much. I really wanted to thank you before I leave. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Irene. So nice to have you with us. Thank you. I'm just putting my email, sorry, my my website into the, into the uh, chat. It's very simple. It's just my name. The hardest part is spelling my my name. Oh, sorry. You know what? I put an F in there. That's wrong. Um, It's really just my name, Linda Hostetler. If anybody would like slides to today, um, you're welcome to go to my website. Um, There's a book page on my website that um, has all kinds of uh, resources, information about uh, recognizing the final 21 days and um, signs of hospice palliative care and all of that signs of the dying process. So if anybody would like to um, follow the work I do at all, any of the events that um, I put out, uh, purchasing books, all that, you can find it on the book page of my website. Thank you very much, Linda. I did mention at the the outset that uh, we can uh, send a free copy of your book to anyone who might be interested. And I would just invite anyone who would like a free copy to simply send me an email and and uh, say in a couple sentences how it could be helpful. 
to either them or their clients or whomever uh, they think might benefit from reading this kind of important book that you've you've written and published. So uh, again, a free copy of your book is available to anyone who would like to write to me at my email address. And uh, again, uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Linda. It's been a very helpful presentation and a delight to meet you in this way and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thanks for hosting me, Robert. It's been great fun um, talking about this and sharing and getting such great questions. Thank you for engaging so well, everyone. Lovely and I will send out the link to the recording uh, shortly. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Thanks. Take care.